Okay, everybody, uh, welcome to the North Star Bad Charts uh, show again. I'm Kevin Wadsworth, and we're here with my partner in crime, Patrick Karim, and uh, we've got Jordan Roy Byrne. Have I pronounced that right, Jordan? Yes, correct, <laughs> in, your, in your great <laughs> accent, so thank you very much. From, uh, from the Daily Gold. Uh, do you want to just uh, let everybody know who you are and what you're about, Jordan? Uh, sure. Well, I... Um... So I write a gold newsletter focused on, um, I'd say half of it is kind of like macro analysis as it pertains to gold. And there's a lot of technical analysis that comes with that. Then the other half is investing in uh, junior miners that have huge potential. And I got started investing when I was pretty young. I got into the tech uh, bull market uh, or bubble. I got in pretty late, I think in early 1999. And I, I made, I got it. I mean, when you get in before the end, like it's still fairly early. Um, so I did really well, but what happened was I was buying stocks. I mean, I still came out ahead, but I was buying stocks on the way down in 2001, thinking, oh, this is a great opportunity. And, you know, I didn't know anything about technical analysis then. And so after that experience, I started studying for the CMT, I think 2002, 2003. Uh, or maybe a year or two after that. But in 2002, 2003, I really started studying charts because I, I knew that there had to be something that explained why markets are making these moves. You know, why are they crashing or why are they moving a certain way? So that got me into technical analysis. And so, um, and I got into um, commodities pretty early. So I started investing in energy and I always knew I was going to get into gold. Uh, so that, uh, you know, I kind of waited because gold had a huge move in, in, into 2003. And so after that, I kind of switched uh, from energy into gold and silver. And that's uh, been, you know, that explains where I am now. So I'm very heavily focused on technical analysis. Well, the thing I like about gold is you can, um, you can chart a lot of uh, fundamental factors. I mean, you, you don't, like, for example, gold against the S&P 500. I mean, that's a huge thing. If you look at gold against oil, you know, all these intermarket relationships. The thing I like about gold is you can understand fundamentals by looking at charts. And you don't, with, with like regular markets, you know, you can't put, you can't really chart earnings or you know, revenue and those types of things. So gold is dependent on these macro relationships. And you can put those up uh, in, in a chart. And so it's it's really nice. So I enjoy that aspect of analyzing precious metals. But that's basically you know, how I came to uh, get, or how I got into technical analysis and why I think it's really important. But I, I, try, and put, I try and merge that together with fundamentals and macro analysis. So I don't, I mean, technicals is where my expertise is, but um, I like to look at all things and not just, you know, only charts. I feel like that's kind of limiting. But if I only had to look at one thing, it would be the charts. Yeah, the, chart, the charts do kind of uh, explain a lot that's uh, going on. It kind of encompasses everything that's uh, going on in the fundamentals. I've often had conversations with Patrick about, you know, the, the idea of fundamentals. And people sometimes ask us about the fundamentals and why you're investing this stock. The fundamentals are terrible, but um, the chart doesn't lie at the end of the day. And the chart provides those support and resistance levels that are always there to give you the, um, the guidance that you need for, for you know, for, for entries and exits. I was just, um, yeah, it looks like Patrick's uh, wanting to, to chip in. Yeah, well, um, because the fundamentals, do you use, do you have to have, I don't mind using fundamentals, but fundamentals that have charts associated with them. I, I love that stuff. But I've often like, often like I've realized that I had a fundamental idea without a chart oh man, the price action is going in my direction. And I thought like, it has to be the reason I had in my head why the price action. And then years later, I realized, Patrick, man, you were, it, was compute, it was random. Like you, your idea of what was moving had nothing to do with the price action. So I'm wondering, do you need charts of fundamentals or you have strong narratives of fundamentals and without charts? And then you, how do you fit that together? Well, I think, I mean, if you're talking about... Um... It's with, with gold, it's so tricky because the fundamentals are really tricky. And I think most people don't really understand it. And uh, so I try and 
drill down and sometimes like too deep, I would say with the fundamentals. I mean, you, you, I think you have to have, uh, you know, a fundamental idea. Um, you don't want to have like a religious viewpoint where you're stuck to it. You want to be flexible, but, um, you want to have an idea of, of what's going on fundamentally. And you want to try and match that with what's going on in the chart. So if we're looking at gold, um, I mean, it's been really tricky because, um, you know, the general fundamentals are pretty good, but, you know, gold made this huge move higher into August, 2020. And so after gold makes a huge move like that, it's going to correct at some point and it needs time, uh, you know, at, at the same time, you can correct through price and time. And so, um, you know, we saw other markets were outperforming gold. And so people weren't understanding that, um, other uh you know gold made this huge move at the beginning of the pandemic but then the market was expecting you know a re rebound economic growth and so that narrative matched up with why gold was performing or has been performing so poorly um just in relative terms in real terms uh, i mean that, that's one thing that shocked me over the last you know 18 months or so is how poorly gold was performing so that you have to look at that and then try and match that with fundamentals so you're always i mean you're always flexible with both and you're just trying to understand um you know what could trigger something either way and so you know i always go back to you know gold's never been in a real bull market without outperforming the stock market and that's why um you know gold hasn't been able to break out of this correction yet um, it hasn't really started to outperform the stock market. And so that's a huge, um, you know, that's a huge trigger. And so just going back over the last six or seven years, you can see every big move that gold has had, it's been associated with uh, de some decline in the stock market. And so like, that's an example of the, the fundamentals of, you know, gold outperforming the stock market. I mean, that relationship is so important. And so that, explains a lot fundamentally where if we're in a real we get into a real stagflation situation or inflation really accelerating you that would be bullish for gold and then you start to see that in the charts where gold will start outperforming the stock market so that's um you know and, and it can just it can happen and sometimes markets will move you know they'll move sooner than you think or you're not really sure what exactly the fundamentals are and then you know a, a market or gold starts moving or it starts breaking out and moving up and then sometimes you just have to respect the price action and understand that you know the market is leading and sniffing as that leading indicator of technicals it's leading and it's sniffing out and starting to discount in advance and then that that's what we've been seeing in the last you know, 16 17 months or so where you could say well the market has already discounted that inflation uh, was going to be rising. And I saw a, a chart of, I think it was GDP and like the PCE, one of those inflation indicators. And it's, it was really interesting to me because the expectations for economic growth, um, th they've been increasing until the last couple months. And so they during this period when expectations for growth were increasing, uh, gold was that's aligns with gold having performed poorly, and at the same time, I noticed in the last like month or two, expectations for inflation next year are starting to increase, and growth is actually starting to come down. And so that's, um, you know, that that's a, a positive for gold if that continues to happen. And so, um, you know, if like if we see bonds start start to have a big rally and gold is outperforming the commodities that could tell us that the narrative has shifted from you know inflation and recovery to stagflation or you know growth is declining quite a bit and it's um me so sometimes when i look at the like at the charts i'm uh, uh there's like where we are now like are the u.s equities going to roll over or are we like in 1996 or seven where that we could like that we could the precious metals could really like go in the bear market or continue like going drifting sideways and we're not going to explode until uh 2024 2025 
And I, I see some charts. I don't often post them, but I look at them and I see some analog moves that maybe we're like in, we're pre melt up in the U S equities. And um, like, do you weigh any probabilities to that happening or we're really closer to 2000 top? Uh, it's a really good question. I think we're too, um, because I think if you look at, you know, I look at things like the Cape, and uh, if you look at sentiment indicators, like uh, one, I think one is households and their investment in equities. I mean, the, that in valuations, they're already at 1999 type levels. So they're so extent, like, sure, it could, it could, you know, the equity market have like a melt up in a year or two. I mean, I guess it's possible, but I just, the evidence, we're, we're, we're so far in the extreme looking at, Again, sentiment indicators, um, also valuations, like at the CAPE ratio, like that's important because if you look at 2010, 2011, 2012, I mean, the CAPE ratio in the stock market, uh, they, they were not extreme. Like in 2009, the CAPE was actually pretty low. Like it was close to a 20 year low. So, you know, people will say, oh, well, this could be 2012 or 2013 for gold. But the problem is, the stock market was in 2012, 2013, the stock market was about to break out of the 13 year base. So it's in a, a totally different position. You know, the Cape was, I don't know what it was, 16, 15, 16, whatever. You know, now the Cape is 40, the market's uh, really extended, you know, it's gone vertical. So it's a completely different situation. I mean, it's a, I, yeah, I just, I, I don't, I don't think you can make a case that this is 1996. Maybe you can make a case that this is 1999 and there's another year left to go, but that's just, you know, we're just relying on the evidence. Uh, you know, we're just guessing, but I think I, I, I don't see um, a chance that it's going to be 1996 or 97. I don't think there's you know, two or three years left. Oh, I was sweating. I'm so happy you said that. It's my. It's good for my echo bubble. <laughs> oh man. So okay, let's say for so in 2011 to 13 top, you were you were playing gold on the way up, but did you manage like to to escape the 2013 to bear market like all the way to those 2015 lows, or you you? Uh, I got I got hit pretty pretty hard in 2013. Uh, um, yeah, I had. I don't want to say I had a religious viewpoint, but when you're in, you're into something. Um, it's uh, you know, it's hard. You, you're always like making justifications at the time. Oh well, you know, you're relying on the data that you want that you're using to justify your bullishness. Oh well, sentiment's really negative, and uh, you know, these companies are really cheap, and so they'll turn around at some point. Um, I did. I mean, I I was. I did get hit, but I was pretty uh i had like a decent amount of cash so i wasn't 100 percent invested but yeah 2013 was definitely uh the worst year out of that period i mean i did pretty well in 2012 just because i picked the right stocks there were still some stocks that were rising but 2013 was definitely rough and then i didn't get hit as hard in the other years because i was uh you know i, I had cash and i really you know 2014 2015 like i really felt like I had a good understanding of the fundamentals and what really drives gold because I, I wrote my first book, which was like an ebook. And so I really was looking at every, you know, every part of gold's history and all these um, just little details and trying to explain everything as best I could. And so that really opened my mind to uh, the fundamentals and what really moves gold and, you know, all these intermarket relationships, but no, I, I did. I'm not going to say like, Oh, I correctly called the top and I you know sold out because I did it. So there's a couple, there's a couple of things that I always look at for, for gold. And uh, one of them is the U S dollar, of course, and they tend to move um, counter, you know, they, they, they move in a counter direction a lot of the time, not always, but a lot of the time. Um, but there's another factor, which is very strong, of course, and that's real rates. And um, real rates are uh, breaking down again uh, at the moment, of course. And uh, interestingly, the Fed funds rate um, has broken below major support and is now lower than it's been at any point in the last 60 years. Um, Patrick keeps reminding me, of course, that the Fed funds rate has been a lot lower back in the 1940s. 
Um, <laughs> chart I've got in trading view doesn't go back quite that far. I don't think I'm just looking at it here. It goes back to the 19. The, the real Fed fund rates, right? Like inflation yeah. adjusted Fed fund rates in the 1940s, right. it was like minus 18, but yeah. it's all depends like on the CPI calculations, right? It's, that's, yeah, it's very, yeah. It's very, dif very difficult because the goalposts keep moving with time. So the way yeah. CPI is calculated, the way everything is calculated never, never stays the same. So you have to be very, very careful in particular, of course, comparing anything pre 19, uh, 70s to, um, to to now, of course, because of the change in the way the monetary system is um, is based and the uh, the breaking up of the Bretton Woods Agreement. So, you know, if you take the last 50 years anyway, from that point in the 1970s onwards, um, we've just broken down below uh, major support on the Fed funds rate. And from the little bit of research that I've done, <clears throat> it seems to me that the Fed funds rate has a slightly stronger influence on the price of gold than the US dollar does. Um, so um, when they're both falling, it appears to me that gold is kind of turbocharged. If they're both uh, rising, then um, gold tends to tends to struggle. But if um, if the Fed funds rate um, is rising and the US dollar is falling, then gold tends to tends to still do pretty well. I don't know if you've got any particular thoughts about those relationships between gold, the Fed funds rate or, or real rates, in fact, I should say um and um and, and the u.s dollar you got any light to shed on that uh no, i completely agree with what you said i remember in the first book i wrote uh talking about fundamentals in the first chapter i did make the same argument that real rates was really the number one like the majority driver for gold and that the dollar was also important but it wasn't as strong of a driver and like here's the thing gold leads the dollar i mean if you look at um and one way to express that, if you look at gold against foreign currencies, one way to express that is just if you multiply gold times the U.S. dollar, that's one way where, where you can see how is gold performing when we're removing the dollar weakness element from it. And that that chart actually, I think a week ago that or two weeks ago, that broke out to a new 52 week high. So that if you look at every major move in recent decades, gold against foreign currencies usually leads that. And what that means is gold usually starts to move before the dollar peaks and you know because gold starts sniffing the dollar peak and then you know after the dollar peaks and rolls rolls over then gold really gets turbocharged to the upside like you said but it's been very interesting because 2019 you know gold actually i think gold broke out there before the dollar peaked and even started to fall so the dollar gold was moving into that breakout and broke out while the dollar was still rising. And I think we've never seen that before in the history of gold and the dollar. So we're in a new period. Um, and we're, we've also kind of seen you know, a little bit in the last week or two, obviously the dollar has been stronger than gold, but gold was able to break to a five month high. And you know, we look at where the dollar is, we would think, I mean, gold's getting hit today, but if we look at where the dollar is, we would think gold is probably trading, you know, in the low 1700s, but that's just not the case. It's at, you know, 1800 or wherever it is today, 1810, 1820. So gold has, I mean, that's even though gold hasn't broken out yet and the correction is still ongoing, the fact that gold is holding up really well while the dollar is what, a 17, 18 month high. I mean, that's just a really good sign telling us that, you know, we're probably towards the end of this 17 month correction in gold. Uh, but what you said about real rates, I, I completely agree. That's the biggest driver. And so people don't, you know, they talk about inflation and all these other things, but it comes back to real rates. And so another reason why gold peaked was because I like to say real rates blew out to the downside. Like that, that was the problem is real rates. And we had this problem in 2011 as well. Uh, where real rates just got they were declining so much and they got so negative that it, there wasn't any room that they could that they could continue to fall and that was the issue 16 or 17 months ago and it's also if you look at 2011 to 2015 real rates were rebounding if you look at the real Fed funds rate I think it went from minus four percent to minus one percent or it was zero at some point so even though real rates were still negative they were increasing during that mega bear market which i call the forever bear market because it seemed like it was lasting forever but um yeah the real rates i mean that's the fundamental underpinning 
um, of this story and why there's just the global economies, you know, the West, the U.S., we can't, given the way everything's set up, they just, they can't tolerate real rates that are positive. So that's, it, it, it's going to take a while to get out of this mess. And Can I ask you a know, question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I'm, just absolutely. Look, I'm just looking at the, um, the chart for Treasury, the 30-year Treasury yield, could be the 10-year yield, it doesn't really matter. And um, it's, it's dropping, of course, and we're into negative figures and have been for some time. The, the question is this, with the US debt as it is, so stated at around 30 trillion, although of course we all know about the unfunded liabilities, with, with a debt bur burden that's been increasing somewhat, somewhat exponentially, do you think it's possible to raise rates sufficiently to control inflation? when inflation breaks out, if inflation breaks out. I mean, we've got inflation occurring all around us at the moment and there's an ongoing right. debate about just how transitory it is. So my my thought experiment is that say inflation rises to approaching 10%, seven, eight, 9%. Um, that's a problem, of course, um, which needs to be brought under control. It was done in the 1970s by raising rates sufficiently. I've had this discussion with Patrick, you know, several times. And, you know, he, Patrick quite rightly talks about GDP and another part of the equation being if you can increase GDP sufficiently, then that balances out the equation, debt to GDP and all the rest of it. And that starts to to um, diffuse the situation. But um, do you the, think the late the late 1940s, by the way, I just wanted yeah. to cut in and mention that. Yeah. So that's the one time it was successful. Exactly. But yeah, continue. Yeah. Yeah, so, <clears throat> um, of course, after the 1940s and after World War II came a, a huge um, sort of surge of development and uh, modernization and um, everything um, that then happened through the 1960s. Um, you know, there was a lot of building of the economies, you know, world economies, um, until we, of course, led into the, the oil crisis in the 1970s and high inflation. But that was all brought under control, you know, in a way by, you know, Paul Volcker and what happened with, um, you know, the raising of rates, you know, that, that kind of. And also, it's not just about raising of rates. It's about the expectation as well. So, you know, it's easy, it, yeah, I think people need to bear in mind it's not just what's being done now that has an effect on markets. It's what is perceived is going to happen in the medium to long term so markets will react not just to what's happening now and what's being done now but what people and investors think is going to be you know the, the course of action over the next few few years so you know with that rising debt uh, and it is rising of course and there's forecast to continue rising do you think there's any tools in the box to to, to control inflation should it break out no and you're, the the I mean that that's an important a very important question because my guess is gold has a super bullish cup and handle pattern that you know we all know of and my thinking is gold is probably going to break out maybe like one year before that becomes an issue like a year before inflation is at a certain point when it's just it's it, it, it the market realizes that it's they're going to have to let it run for like a year or two they're just going to have to let it run and see what happens i think that my guess is that's going to align with you know gold having this massive breakout like i i just feel like that's when gold is really going to break out and accelerate well not exactly at the same time but you know cuz markets lead as you were saying but gold will probably break out and and have that spectacular move like the real core of it um i think is the narrative around that eventually you know maybe like a year after the breakout happens will be that the market realizes okay inflation is going to have to run really hot right now because the fed can't raise rates that i mean that is the we're drilling down to why gold is really bullish in the big picture i mean that's i think like the core of the argument if we're trying to simplify it to like one or two sentences so um i mean obviously we know that gold has a, a cyclical 
behavior, eight and 16 year cycles um, um, feature strongly. Um, of course, 2000, 2008, 2016, um, and then the next eight year cycle though, 2024. So my thinking is for, for several years now has been that this big breakout that you just spoke about will be post 2024 and post the eight, after the, the next eight year cycle low. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Do you see it breaking out ahead of 2024 or uh, do you see it happening in the second part of this, um, this decade? Um, I, you know, I, I think um, it's hard to say. I mean, I, 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 if, if we would have gotten up to 1900 on this move, I would have felt good about it breaking out next year. So I, I think that's still a possibility. I still think, um, I, I mean, I still think I would, so next, I still think 22 or 23, like I see it happening next year or, or early in 2023. I, I don't think it's going to, um, run another two or three years before breaking out. I think, I mean, economically, the, if it, if it takes beyond that time, and it's, you know, two, three, four years, uh, the economic argument would be that growth is pretty solid and inflation is pretty low. That, that would be the, you know, the, the macro scenario that really hurts gold. But I, I have a tough time just seeing that happen. And I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of cycles. I mean, because to me, they're subjective. I mean, they're, they're there, but they wouldn't be the primary factor of analysis. And so if gold, I mean, if gold makes this huge move, I think he's at 2024 as the eight year cycle low. I mean, may, maybe 2020, you know, maybe gold that makes this huge move in 2024 and then you know, in five years, we look back at the chart and people say, oh, well, 2000, it was actually in 2023. Like that was the eight year cycle low. So it can, you know, it can come like a year, it can come a year sooner or it's like a year later. And so I just think, I think five to seven years from now, we all think gold's going to be much higher, but I think we can, we'll look at the chart and still we'll be able to point to something saying, oh, well, it happened here or it was just like a year before or you know, even though gold made this huge move higher, you know, the low was right here. Um, because if you go back and you look at the bull market in the 2000s, I think um, 2004 was supposed to be a cycle top. And I mean, it was it, it, it was an important top at the time. But now that we're looking at it, like we can see that really wasn't a big deal you know, because we had this bull market and it wasn't a major top like uh, 2008 was um, or. Um, you could say 2016. So I, I, yeah, I would just say with cycles like that would be like secondary in my analysis. And I just think that we'll, as I was saying, like we'll be able to justify the eight year cycle low somehow, even if gold makes this huge move. How, you dare, know, you, over the next seven years. How dare you bring down the cycle analysis out there? <laughs> well, it's well, interesting, just, interesting I, because some, some of the charts have, suggested gold peaking sometime in late 2023 or 2024 and we've had one or two uh, people saying well how can you have a gold peaking in 2024 if you've got cycle low in 2024 but my answer to that was look at 2008 gold peaked uh, in march i think it was 2008 and then came crashing down so you had the peak and then you had well, yeah, a, let, 40 percent yeah and let, let me yeah sorry to interrupt but let me posit this i mean because i was thinking i did an interview yesterday and i was thinking um, you know, I was just looking at gold's historical performance, like over certain time periods, I was just using the ROC indicator. And when I put like a two, a two year um, on that, I was seeing how many times gold has been able to move 100% over a two year period. So let's posit that if gold breaks out um, sometime next year and it doubles, over a two year period, depending on where the, you know, what we use as the low, uh, the price can be 3,800, you know, 4,000, something like that in 2024. And so you could get, maybe it happens at the end of 2024, you could get a peak because gold made a huge breakout sometime next year, and then it runs for two years and it makes this vertical move to 4,000 or 3,700, you know, whatever, 
around that level, uh, th that could, you know, that could be a top. And so I think, you know, I, to me, it would just be like a coincidence, but uh, cycles guys would say, yeah, well that, you know, the, the eight year cycle, it came in perfectly, but I'm just showing how it can actually, it can actually fit either way. But, you know, maybe 2025 turns out to be the top of the initial breakout move. And then, you know, the cycles analysis will say, oh yeah, well, it was just one year late. Like it just came one year later. So there, I just think there's a lot, I just think if we're looking back, like there's a lot of flexibility in that. And it just, to me, it just should be secondary, uh, you know, amidst all the other it's good, things. It's a I mean, good it's, thing. I'm not uh, religious about my cycles, isn't it? But it's just a, it's just uh, another piece of uh, evidence in the jigsaw puzzle. Just one, sorry, Pat. One, sorry. Have you looked at the 30-year cycle? Because it's interesting. Like, I'm not a huge cycles guy, but the 30-year for inflation in commodities. So you had, I think you had uh, 1920 was a peak, 1951. 1980, 2011. And so it's, you can go back, I think a little bit further than that. And apparently every 60 years is a massive inflation peak. And so you have the civil war, you have 1920, 1980, and then 2040. And so that's why, like one thing we have to remember is it takes a lot of time for these things to play out. And that's why, um, I mean, if you think about we're 2021, so 24, that's 19 years away. And so the, the, and also another thing, if you look at, I say the real bull market in gold hasn't started yet, and that's because, you know, gold hasn't really outperformed the stock market, you know, a couple of weeks or a month ago, wherever it was, I think it was like at a 16 year low, which is shocking to me. But you look at that, you look at, you know, the 60 year, 30 year cycle, um, and then you look at um, gold having this, you know, massive cup and handle base. Which I mean, that's going to give rise to really good performance, not just for a couple of years, but probably you know seven, ten years. So that's another. I mean, these are other things to consider. But that that's one cycle that's really interesting to me: the, the thirty and sixty year cycle for inflation. Have, have you guys looked at that? I mean, is that factored into any of your work? I didn't even know that existed. The sixty year cycle is that based on oil, oil prices, or I just like, inflation? I think in commodities. Inflation? Okay. Ouch. Uh, there's uh, James, Flan James Flanagan from GAN Global Financial. He's the one who's done a lot of research on that. He doesn't you, you yeah, need charts going back a review. Need charts going back a couple hundred years to pick out 60 yeah. years. Cycles well, and I, I, I love looking at those charts. I mean, yeah. it, and I'm sure you guys do as well. It just yeah. gives you, no, I mean, you, you, we, you, all these charting platforms, you know, they only give you 10 or 20 years. I mean, that's nothing in terms of financial history, it's, especially with gold. I mean, the, there's not a lot of history. You know, you only yeah. have, um, you know, you only have the bull market in the seventies, the bear market, the, uh, the bull market in the two thousands. But anyway, you know, one, but there were a lot, there were, I think some cycles guys who were saying, you know, okay, now we're going to have <clears throat> after 2011, they were saying, now we're going to have a 20 year, uh, you know, a 20 year bear market for gold. <laughs> so it's, yeah, so it's it's also similar to Elliott Wave. Like you have Elliott Wave guys who are saying gold's going to go to eight hundred. I know who you know, you're talking have, about. I know who I know. About. I know who he's talking about. But but even gonna, but even but even, but even Robert Prechter, who you know who's the the originator of the Elliott Wave theory, um, and he's a great analyst. And he, um, I think he won like a trading championship in the '80s. So he's a super smart market analyst. I think he. I remember him calling the end of the bear market in 2009, like to the week he said, you know, the bear market is over. But he had this viewpoint because of the cycle that in the late 90s, he was saying, you know, gold's going to go to, I don't know, 200 or like 150 or something. And then we're going to have this massive bull market. But he was holding on to that for like years and years after gold had already went up. And so that sometimes that's the problem with things like cycles and, you know, just it, they're too subjective and then people can like hold on to it where it's like, no, I mean, <clears throat> see, here's the issue with cycles analysis is people try and map, they try and map the market to the cycle. So the, the, the cycle is more important than the actual market where that's really false. That's not how you should be doing it. You have to watch the market and then the cycle should be a secondary subjective thing. You can't fall into, 
well, you know, the cycle says every four weeks the market does this. And so I'm waiting for the market to match up to this. You have to be really careful about that and just, you know, follow the market objectively and just respect what happens. Yeah. So yeah. like if I have a pyramid of technical analysis, price action, like classical charting should be at the most important. And then if it happens that the price action is doing a, uh, it's coming to retest an important long-term moving average. And that matches up with a cycle like that's repeated three, four or five times in the past or three times at least, then it gives added evidence. But I would always, the price action has to be like the, the number one. Yeah, right. and, 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 you know, I follow a few people on, uh, on social media, like Norvast, for example, for example, Malcolm, and when he does his cycle analysis, to be fair, you know, the cycles aren't confirmed unless they break. Um, you know, 10 day um, inclining trend lines. And, um, you know, there are certain rules that, you know, so they, they are, you know, using technical analysis um, by default, really, to confirm the cycle break. Right. Yeah. Cycle mode. Oh, that, so, and so I, I, you know, I, I'm not a cycles guy, but, you know, I just put it No, I, I will cycle, say, you know. sorry to, so, yeah, sorry to interrupt. I will say the best cycles guy, they're actually using technical analysis yeah. along with the cycles. So, that, that, yeah, that's a really good point. And I think, you know, if you if you get like the primary trend right, and your cycles get, then your 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 cycles are always going to look like they're working because you have the you have the primary trend right. But at the same, like if you're off on the primary trend, it it, it just you're not going to get anything right. You know, the, the deflation cycles guy and uh, or guys, you know that that sort of thing. It just it looks ridiculous. But if you have the if you get the primary trend right, oh, the stock market's going up, gold's correcting, then whatever, you know, oh, there's a 14-day cycle and, and this happens, and th th it's going to look more accurate when you have the primary trend right. Yeah, so that's Absolutely, absolutely. That's absolutely. One, on one, more, one more question I want to ask you. I know we're, uh, your time's precious and we've probably been going for, I don't know, 30, 40, No, we're, we're good. We can, we can keep going. That's okay. <laughs> but uh, I just, I, people are probably shouting at me to ask about silver as well. Lots of people... Uh, interested in silver and just wondered if you had any particular thoughts on how silver might react. It tends to be a lot spikier, of course, than gold and its uh, its days of glory tend to be much shorter, but much more glorious uh, than gold, of course, amplifying its uh, moves um, at certain points. So I wonder what your thoughts are on silver. Well, I think in 20 years or so in technical analysis textbooks, uh, the cup and handle patterns that we see in gold and silver like those are going to be, they're going to be in technical analysis textbooks when they talk about cup and handle patterns. Um, so now gold's pattern is more pure, it's textbook. So silver is, it's, 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 it's not really textbook because it had this huge decline. But if you look at um, what Hong Kong did in the 70s and 80s, like that chart reminds me of silver's massive cup and handle where the the, the cup is so big that the handle is its own cup and handle pattern. Um, I So it really, I mean, looking at silver, it really, the macro is really important because if we get into a, if next year we get into a situation where um, inflate, you know, inflation actually falls a little bit and, you know, there's real concerns over growth in a recession, Gold is going to do well in that environment. Maybe, maybe gold breaks out, but silver is going to lag. However, if we get into an inflation blow off uh, type period, maybe that'll be the end of this expansion. Is silver is definitely going to lead. So I always, you always have to look at inflation and inflation expectations because in that scenario, silver is going to lead. If it's an economic weakness, gold will lead. And so, I mean, my guess is I think gold is, it's just, it's far ahead of silver. I think gold is going to break out, um, obviously, and silver, I think will break 50, but I think it's going to take more time. Like it might take a year or two after gold breaks 2100, because if we're looking at the gold silver ratio, you know, maybe gold, maybe gold has to get 25, 2700 before silver uh, can get back to 50 and break 50. So that's, I know that the uh, silver people are obviously really excited and I am too. I'm mean, heavily invested, um, but I'm just, I'm a little more patient with silver. And I, I that's just my sense is that gold is going to break out first and kind of lead and then silver will really catch up. But 
you know, what if and when silver does break 50, I mean, that's going to be super explosive. Um, that not cup and handle, I think if a measured upside target, you know, 95 or 96, something like that. Um, so that that's going to be really exciting, but I don't, I'm not quite, there's not enough, uh, <clears throat> there's not enough things I can look at, I think, to really project when that might happen. Um, it's obviously dependent on the macro and, I mean, I do, I do think, you know, given my view that the 30 year, 60 year inflation cycles are legitimate. I mean, I do think silver is going to trade much, much, much higher. I think eventually it could peak at like a thousand dollars an ounce, but I think it has, ma I think it has many years to run. Like we're still very early in the story. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, that. That's my view on silver. I mean, it's it's gonna gold's gonna have a massive breakout. I, in my opinion, I think in the next year or two, and silver could follow maybe a year after that. Um, but it's yeah, I know you 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 make good points about how it like it doesn't really have consistent uh, moves higher. Like it's you know you see a lot of consolidation and then these short sharp bursts. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out along with gold. It's the, the toughest, uh, if you look at silver, it's probably the, you can't trade that beast because it, it's going to explode. Everybody drops in on the top. Everybody gets in on the fear of missing out, the silver squeeze, all that. And then it hibernates for uh, six months to two years. It, it just, it kills you emotionally, right? Yeah. It does that every single time, like in the bull run from 2001 to 11, it did it four or five times. You can't trade that unless you, unless you, you're, you didn't buy like at the FOMO, right? If you bought, yeah. you're patient, then I have two two questions, and after that, I'll be I'll be happy with uh, our uh, conversation. Tell me one thing which makes you think that we're not at the 2011 2013 top right now in the price action because I see a lot of similarities. But I, if you had to give me one argument why we're not at a 2013 type of top, what would it be? You mean in gold or silver? Gold or for gold? gold? Oh well, I think. Um... I, that's a really good question. I mean, one chart that I use is looking at the CAPE and looking at the uh, gold to S&P or gold stocks to S&P ratio. And so if you look at the CAPE ratio for the market, like 2012, 2013, if we look at where the stock, the stock market at that point in time was close to breaking out um, of a 13 year base. So it broke out of a 13 year base in 2013. And around that time, the CAPE ratio uh, I think it was like 17, 18, and it's somewhere around there. It was a little bit lower in 2009. Um, so the stock market was just breaking out of a 13-year base, and valuations were much, much lower. Now the CAPE, I think, is like at 40. I mean, it's like nearly at 1999 levels. Um, and if you look at if you look at the relationship of gold to the S and P or gold stocks to the S and P, you know, you look at those 100-year charts, you can see that they're around the lows. I mean, maybe I can, I can uh, try and, and uh, pull that up as I'm talking. Uh, just whilst, but, whilst you're doing uh, that, can you just explain what CAPE, um, yeah. you don't know what CAPE is, just uh, probably quite a few It's, a, it's basically, a, it's, the, it's a 10 year cyclically adjusted price earnings ratio. So it's like a 10 year PE ratio for the market. And it really, um, it really, li it lines up really well with how the market performs over the next 10 years. So when the CAPE gets really high, historically, you know, the market doesn't, stock market doesn't do that well over the next 10 years. Um, and uh, so it's, uh, um, yeah, so I don't, I don't know how to, um, yeah, how don't, to share my screen, but um, yeah, don't, I don't know, maybe we could, we can post it somewhere, but yeah, yeah I'm just looking at, but the interesting thing is, so if we look at gold stocks, because I have a, some historical indexes that go back. Um, if we look at gold stocks against the stock market, the most significant lows in that ratio were 1929. Um, and then for this index, I think it was 1964, uh, but also two, uh, I think 2000, 2001. <clears throat> and recently we've made, you know, we've made since 2015, we've made like two or three lows in this ratio, which it looks very similar to like the 1960s, to be honest. And so if we're looking at the Cape, you know, the peaks in the Cape were 1929, 
the next one was 1966, 2000. And you know, the 2000 was like, I think at 44. And so now we're like up at 40. Uh, so, you know, compared to like, if we look at 2011, um, in 2011, the Cape was 19. Um, and at that point, you know, precious metals had outperformed the stock market for 10 years. So th this is, I mean, this intermarket analysis and looking at these historical relationships, they tell you so much. Like they're telling us how extended the stock market is in nominal terms, but also relative to like gold and gold stocks. And so when you look at these ratios, you can see that, you know, the precious metals, it looks a lot like the 1960s. And so it's, when we look at these things, it's not even close to where they were in 2012, 2013. So I just, I don't, you know, and then also what I said before about if we look at um, households and their investment in stocks, like their allocation to stocks is like at an all time high. And, th and that, that chart, I mean, that data is significant because it correlates really, really well with forward returns for the stock market. So when it gets really high, like it is now, uh, next 10 years returns for the stock market are not good. And at the same time, um, do you guys look at the, the, I think it's the Bank of America, like the fund manager survey, that data that comes out. It's interesting. I mean, I'll, I think I'll retweet this because I saw the chart on Twitter. Right now, you have like a historical extreme with fund managers owning stocks. And it's interesting because actually bonds, they're super low on bonds. So that's why I think next year, you know, we could see people should consider the scenario of, you know, we get a rally in bonds, you know, commodities cool off, uh, maybe at the same time, you know, the stock market cools off and corrects and, you know, gold, you know, silver would probably struggle initially in that environment, but I think gold um, could do well in that environment. So in that, you know, in that scenario, you know, silver, even in that type of scenario, silver, it catches up to gold eventually. Um, but that's, you know, that's one thought on how um, next year could go. All right. I'm, okay. I'm convinced. And, <laughs> and my second final question is everybody sometimes they say, okay, the gold to silver ratio, historic 15 to one, 12 to one. But honestly, when I look at the chart, I don't give much credence to any ratio before 1970 because gold was pegged. So for me, it's like nonsense to, to try to uh, figure that out. So I don't, what's your view on targeting silver price like to a, a target gold to silver ratio? So like how do you fit that in the equation there? Or how do you use the gold silver ratio in, uh, in like in your weight of evidence? Um, I, I honestly don't use it that much. I mean, I think it's a, it's a good, um, it's a good indicator when we're looking at, you know, short term or medium term to figure out are we in an inflation expectation, you know, inflation rising, uh, higher inflation expectations? Are we in that environment or are we in an environment of <clears throat> concerns about growth, economic weakness? So that, I mean, uh, that's what I would use it for <clears throat> in, the near, uh, in, in the near term. Now, very big picture, something I noticed when I look at it is, um, when, when, you know, inflation and commodities, when they make these major historical peaks every 30 or 60 years, <clears throat> that's when the ratio gets down to, you know, around 15, what you're talking about. And that's why I say, I think eventually silver could go to a thousand because if gold is going to peak at 20,000 or 15,000, wherever silver lines up, that's how it lines up. <clears throat> but, you know, as we know, there's a huge, a huge move comes at the very end. So, you know, maybe silver goes from 500 to a thousand or whatever, when it peaks, something like that. Um, but that that's, so the idea that like the gold silver ratio is going to hit 30 or like 20 or 25, it's just, it's not going to happen in the middle of the bull market. Like when that happens, it's probably going to be you know way towards the end. But I mean, looking at, I'm looking at the historical chart. I mean, 45, like 40, 45. I mean, it's possible <clears throat> somewhere in the middle of the bull market. I mean, we could hit that. Um, so, 
you know, when we see, like I mentioned, you know, the, the logarithmic target, like the percent target of Gold's cup and handle, I mean, you could measure that out to 4,100 maybe. And so maybe that'll align with silver getting to a hundred. I mean, it's just a, it's just a thought or a guess, uh, but that that's something I would <clears throat> consider there. Yeah, that's. Uh, I, I was just trying to share the uh, gold silver uh, ratio on screen there. I don't know if you guys can see that. Can you see it or not yet? Yes, yeah, I, I can it. see it. You can. Oh, good. <laughs> yes. It worked. It works great. Um, just so that uh, people uh, watching and listening can see what we're we're talking about with gold silver ratio there. So you can see it back to the uh, late 1990s here and how it's performed uh, over that period of time. Of course, the recent spike. Um, went all the way up here, um, well beyond 100, didn't it? I think it was uh, 120, over 120 uh, back in 2020. Um, but we've dropped, dropped back a fair bit since then. Um, and silver's, silver's recovered to some extent. This, this red zone I've got in here is the, uh, is the eight year cycle uh, low, just for, just for reference, if it does actually occur during that time period. <laughs> With everything else that we said earlier on about uh, cycle lows, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, we've we've clearly sort of pulled back. Um, we've got a something of a bullish pennant uh, developed there, and price has broken out and moved up to to some extent as well. So I, do, I must admit, I do struggle a little bit with the gold silver ratio to um, to deduce um, too much from it. It's, uh, it's it's a piece of evidence that can be can be used from time to time, but um, you you kind of you know it's just a, it's a ratio isn't it so you need to know where gold's right. going you need to know well, it's, it's, a, it's a good <laughs> work out. But I would, it's, it's a good mat it's a good you know short term it's a good macro indicator to as i was saying you know are we are we in like a rising inflation environment or like concerns over growth so sometimes that can it can can give you a signal on that either I think, way i think the ratio drops well you know it'll, it'll drop drastically if and when uh, silver, you know, exactly. starts, to, starts to take oh. on its mon monetary role. At the moment, it's acting as a commodity, and it's acting, in my view, as an undervalued commodity. It's ridiculously mm. undervalued. You know, it's um, been lingering around at these levels for for, for decades, essentially. Um, whilst everything else has inflated to, you know, to the to you know to the skies. But um, mm. so silver's silver's time will come, and you know, when that happens, of course, this ratio is going to drop like a rock. Um, but uh, you know, it's it's a waiting game until then. Um, we've got some horizontal support here around about sixty. Was that sixty four? Somewhere mid sixties. I've shown you before. If you put a correlation coefficient on any ratio and compare it, let's say to silver, it'll tell you what that ratio. Who's moving that ratio more, right? And the gold silver ratio, it's a fifty fifty correlation. Let's say with gold, but it's mostly silver that drives this ratio uh, inversely, right? So when this ratio really drops, you you uh, it's very bullish for silver, and gold can go up with that ratio going up. It's like I think the the pot, it's a negative uh, pot, negative correlation to fifty percent, but Ke Kevin's going to pop up the uh, silver. Where's your silver or XAG XAU hey. XAG? Does it matter which gold or silver? XAG, it? Yeah, because you'll see with it's with silver that 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 ratio has. Okay, XAG then. There we go. Well, we'll end up short. You see that that you see that the negative correlation? It's huge. Yeah. So that ratio is really important for silver. And if you put that, if you if you do a copy paste of that Spearman correlation coefficient, and put gold, it's nah, it's uh, it's not as strong a negative correlation. So silver bulls, they really need, but maybe it goes in line with what Jordan says. If that ratio is going down, it's inflation, it's uh, and that, you know. And one thing I want to look at, um, I, my sense is that silver has it outperforms like after major breakouts in gold. So that's something I'm going to look at today. Just gold, the significant breakouts in gold, you know, 2009, 2005 was also a significant one. Um, you know, obviously in the 70s and, you know, we can look at 20, 2019, I think it was a little different because the dollar was still rising. But I, I think my guess would be you know, silver really out, it starts to really outperform when gold breaks out. And if the dollar is falling or rolling over at the same time. Um, so that's my, that's why my guess, my sense is 
you know, if gold breaks out, if it breaks 2100 and we're not in a inflation environment at that time, um, that could be the point when silver starts to outperform gold again. I mean, and that's if we're, you know, if, if the driver for gold is an economic weakness, you know, growth concern type environment. Can't wait. This is, it's a fascinating journey, man, since 2018 there. This, uh, no, you, you're right, because, you know, we have the, you know, we don't, we didn't have a lot of history. You know, we only had one, really, you know, we had, or you know, one secular bull in the 70s and then the 2000s and then the bear market. Um, so there wasn't a lot of history to draw on like we can with the stock market where there's numerous cycles going both ways. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's fascinating because we've, we've never seen, you know, gold break out with the dollar rising that happened in 2019. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, it's definitely fascinating because we, we don't have that much history to draw on. But I will, you know, one thing, the last thing I will mention you know, which I'm sure you guys have looked at, you know, rate hikes, when the Fed starts these rate hiking cycles, they've yeah. marked a lot of significant, I mean, 1999, 2015, 1976, they're all, the Fed started rate hiking cycles during those major lows in gold. So that's another thing to consider. If the Fed, like, if you tell me if the Fed starts hiking next year and they're going to be they're going to be able to, you know, do hikes for like a year or two, then I mean, that then uh, you know, gold's going to explode out of that because that, that would indicate that inflation is accelerating and they have to, you know, continue to hike to, you know, somewhat save face and keep up with it. So that that's another thing I'm watching over the next you know, six or nine months is uh, the potential rate hike. And an another aspect of that gold typically declines at four or five, six, seven months into the hike. I mean, not a serious decline, but in many examples, it declines into the hike. But if you look at the last four rate hike cycles, gold's average rebound initially was 28%. So that's another thing to keep in mind. I mean, gold could, you know, if they, decl if, if they, um, if they're going to hike middle of next year, you know, gold could decline in the first half of the year, but then, have a really strong move the last half of the year. So that's another scenario to consider with the rate hikes. It's going to be fascinating because if the rate hikes can't keep up with inflation, then the real rate carries on falling and the narrative changes and suddenly right. becomes a lot more serious. So the first rate hikes might have a, a somewhat negative uh, effect on gold, um, you know, with people kind of thinking, well, okay, this is this is a good thing. Um, and then suddenly it becomes not a great thing because we're hiking rates to try and catch up with inflation and suddenly um, things are, you know, the wheels are starting to fall off. So it may, may well start as a kind of, okay, this is under control kind of uh, narrative and then quickly descend into something that's, um, okay, guys, this is, this is starting to fall apart and we're not catching up with the, the, the rate of inflation. So if that scenario begins to unfold, then I think, um, you know, obviously, precious metals, gold, silver will uh, will will take off very quickly to the upside. Um, so it's it's all around that narrative. But of course, all that all, you know, that narrative and the fundamentals are all wrapped up very neatly for us, right back where we started with the price chart. So it takes me back to what we we're saying at the beginning: is that the technical, you know, fundamental, uh, the um, traditional technical analysis is is key to all of this. It gives you your support levels, gives you your breakout levels. And um, all the noise that's going on, you know, out there in the big wide world, it's uh, it's all condensed nicely onto the price chart. And of course, all three of us will be um, keeping a very close eye on those over the next few uh, months and years. Thanks. So, uh, Thanks, Kevin. Th thank Jordan, man. It's a true honor to, to have you on. And uh, I follow all the stuff you do, even when you do bearish comments on gold. I still, I said, okay, I have to listen to Jordan because you're like my voice of reason when my fear of missing out goes to the roof because I'm super emotional. Okay, what's Jordan saying? I always check, like, you know, you need like, you gotta, you know, you need a balance, right? Because or else uh, I'll be the guy buying silver at 29 every single time. I don't want to be that guy, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, thank, thank you for the kind comments. Uh, you, you guys do great work and uh, I really enjoyed the conversation. Just the yeah. excellent stuff. Thank you guys so much for having me. That's Guys, Jordan. yeah, we'll put all the links to all your, your, your where you want to send people, Jordan. And uh, when you get that Cape Ratio chart again, there we'll retweet it 
and I uh, hope to have you on again. Yep, yep. I'll, right. uh, I'll echo that and I'll uh, say goodbye for now, Jordan, and uh, no doubt we'll speak to you again very soon. Right. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye, Thank Jordan. you, guys. Bye-bye.